first of all, I just want to say, please, don't lose heart. We're living in a day when, when there's a lot of things getting thrown at the church, when there's a lot of things happening, uh, a lot of sickness, a lot of disease, a lot of, a lot of concerns of mosquitoes and goodness knows what else. And, uh, you know, the government and with GSTs and, and, and just trying to work out and we're lis- listening to the gloom and doom people that are saying that, you know, something has to be done because Australia is going bankrupt, basically. Is that a, you know, we don't want to hear about that, but our God says, I'll supply all of your need. Amen. And uh, I believe that mud crabs will come out of the river crawling up to our backyard and fish will, you have to put the bait on behind a tree because they'll be jumping on into your boat. But it's not a time to lose heart. Uh, don't give up. Uh, you will make it. We're going to make it. How many people believe we're going to make it? We will, we will make it. God can make a way where there is no way. God can make a way. You've got to remember that God did amazing things. Only believe all things are possible. I want to encourage us to to be believers. You've got to speak to the mountains and remove the obstacles that are in our way, the unbelief, the wrong thinking. Don't give up and say, uh, I won't make it. Don't give up and say, I'll never make it. Don't give up and say things that are contrary to what the Word of God says about us. God says we're going to make it. Amen. I I believe we're going to make it. And in, in In the prayer meeting this morning, while we're praying in the back room there, uh, you know, God just started to show me that, you know, God is going to restore. It says that your old men will dream dreams. And I believe that there's a restoration, that things that we've dreamed about as, even as young men, things that, that God's spoken to us about as, as younger people perhaps, that God is going to stir that again within us. And we're going to start to dream those dreams again, dreams of greatness, dreams of our future, dreams, dreams of the purpose of God. And, and, and I'm, I'm really believing for this year to be a restoration of all things. That God's going to restore again the joy. He's going to restore again the victory. There's going to be a restoration that's going to come. So don't give up and say, I'll never make it. Don't give up and say, nothing's going to change. You've got to speak to yourself, this is my year my year of breakthrough. This is when I'm going to break through. Uh, you know, the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I'm going to start speaking what the Word of God says about me, not what I feel, not what I think. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. And you know, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's something that happened 20 years ago or something that happened 10 years ago, something that happened yesterday. I'm going to encourage myself. Because you see, those things there, they can be an encouragement to us. I remember when I was a young Christian, and you can say, well, that was a long time ago. Yes, it was over 40 years ago. But as a young man, uh, and just been born again, and and I was building a house uh, for my wife and myself, and I was building it late at night and weekends and goodness knows what, whenever I had a a time. And, uh, you know, the, the first thing you do is we build it on high stumps, and the first thing you'd do is put up a set of stairs, the front steps, and then you'd work, and then you'd push all the rubbish out the back door. And uh, I was pushing all the rubbish out the back door. I had a heap of rubbish out there, never ever fixed it up, basically, but it was just a heap of rubbish that had accumulated. And I remember I was putting on the back door, and as I was putting on the back door, there's a little grub screw. And uh, as I was putting that grub screw in, it fell, and it dropped into the, all this rubbish as the back door. And I can remember running from the front through the house and I was saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Walked up to that bunch of a heap of rubbish and there it was, picked it up, ran back up the steps. Thank you, Jesus. You see, God can do whatever he wants to do. Nothing's too hard for God. God can, that little grub screw, that, you, know, if, you know what it's like, they only put one grub screw in and if you lose the grub screw, you're in trouble. And, but, you know, I just picked that little thing up and, and, and away I went rejoicing. And I believe that's what God wants us to start to remember the things that God did for us in the past and, and, and start to regurgitate those things. You see, uh, you, you can be a spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit person and still live a defeated life. So there's some things I believe to live in victory, we must know the truth. It's not, you know... 
what, what people are saying, what, what we're hearing from the, from the government at the moment, what we're hearing that they've got to do this and they've got to do that, and, and you know, two-thirds of whatever is a massive amount of money is going into social welfare and the hospital system and everything else. Friend, I want to tell you, we don't re- by rights, we don't need a hospital. We've got Jesus, amen. But God's got to restore some stuff into us that we dare to believe God, that somehow or other we tap into the, that resource that God has made available to every Christian and break through and not be, and not be concerned about these things. I, I believe to, to live in victory, we've got to know the truth. It's the truth that makes us free. Uh, the truth is Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan. Do you believe that today? How Jesus triumphed over Satan and, 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 and took back the keys of hell and of death. Jesus either won the victory for us or he didn't. I believe he did. I'm going to choose to believe. I'm going to choose to put my trust in God, not in what I hear. Then he sent the greatest power this earth will ever see. He sent the greatest power to live in the hearts of every believer. You know, if, if we could somehow or other know and understand what is inside of us, what really is inside of us. You know that the Word of God today is working mightily in you? If we come in around the Word of God and if we start muttering the Word of God and if we start speaking what God says about us, this Word that is in us, you know, we've most surely got so much Word in us in this church. Over the years, wherever churches you've gone to, over the years, you've got the Word of God in you. But friend, I want to tell you, you've got to mix that Word with faith. You've got to regurgitate it. You've got to start rejoicing over the day you ran down the steps and found that grub screw. You've got to re- remember that day that God healed you. You've got to remember that day. It might have been a long time ago when, when God answered your prayer, when God made a way for you. And get excited about it. Amen. Don't look now and say, well, I'm over. It's finished. I can't make it. This is that and that. I want to tell you that God is bigger than whatever os- obstacle comes your way. God is bigger than anything that would try to stop you or come and rob from you. We know that the Bible says that the enemy comes to rob, to kill and destroy. But I want to say God says, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. You can draw upon whatever you want to draw upon today. You can gather and, and pull into yourself today and allow, say, the word of God is in me. And greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. And the word of God is working mightily in me. I don't know what you had for breakfast this morning, but I had two eggs on toast. <laughs> I know, but I know this for a fact, and you don't have to even go to hospital or, or, or uh, no, hey, medical school to understand this, but those two eggs are working mightily in me. <laughs> hey, if you have a chili, that chili's working mightily in you, amen, one way or the other. You, but see, you've got to realize that those things are working in us. But we've got something more powerful than two eggs. We've got more, something more powerful than, than chilies. We've got the Word of God that's working mightily in me. And that Word of God wants to spring up in me. And that Word of God, when trials come and tribulations come, it wants to spring up in me and say, Neil, you are more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Come on, this sickness is not under death, but it's to, it's to demonstrate the power of God. And by my stripes you are healed. And we grant Grab hold of the greatest power on earth and we live in it. Amen. Amen. We don't take notice of the doctor's reports. We don't allow those things to dominate. Sure, the doctors might say this, but God says, by my stripes you are healed. And that's how we've got to get hold. He he gave us this mighty power, the, the power, this power, the mighty Holy Spirit enables us to also triumph over Satan. How many people want to triumph over the devil? Come on, the Word of God will do that. And the Bible says, Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. That's 2 Corinthians 2.14. Thanks be unto God who always, not sometimes, but always. Friends, sometimes, you know, when we miss it out, when we miss out, sometimes when things don't go the way we plan, sometimes when, when trouble comes, you know, and we start to lose heart, We start to get discouraged. We start to get, you know, despondent, whatever it might be. But I want to tell you that greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. God has freely given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. 
Is that what the Word of God says? All things, Bible also says, no weapon formed against me will prosper because of the great power that we can call upon or draw upon. Draw from that, draw from that, draw from it, draw from that mighty resource. Satan has uh, cunning devices. He comes to, 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 to sow a lie or, or something like that. But Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. God, by his word, does not want us to be ignorant of what God has made available to us. And you see, when the enemy comes, he comes to, to take away what God said. And if you remember when Jesus was here and, and he walked on this planet, and as uh, John was baptizing, and he looked up and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus came down and got water baptized by John. And as he came out of the water, the Bible says, A voice came from heaven. And that voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately just says that Jesus was led into the wilderness by the spirit where he was tempted by the demons and the demonic forces. And the first thing that the devil came and tempted him with is what God said about him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the enemy came and said, if you are the son of God. Cause this bread to become stone. And you see, Jesus could have tried to prove who he was. But friend, you've got to know who you are. You've got to know who you are. We are children of God. Amen. And everything that God has made and done is, is mine. As, as we're saying there this morning, it's not what you do. It's what God has already done for us. And he's made a way for us. And he's made, I believe, an amazing way. And I believe that God wants to do even more than we could ever imagine or think. The Bible says in Hebrews uh, 12, uh, sorry, 2, verse 1 and, uh, to 3, it says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. It's so easy to drift away from the truth of God's word when trials come, when, when things happen to us that don't seem right when things there that get, a, get around us that, that are contrary to the Word of God. I, I'm always reminded, the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us out of them all. We've got to keep our eye on Jesus and He will deliver us out of them all. There are many trials, there are many tribulations, there are many things, and afflictions even, that come our way. But God wants to deliver us from them all. And it says, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape? Friend, we can't neglect this word. We cannot neglect the word of God. The word of God is either truth or it's a lie. How many people believe it's a truth? We choose to believe it's a truth. Amen. And so we can grab hold of that truth. We can grab hold of what God's saying to us. He's saying that by my stripes you're healed. He's saying, I, if I love you with an everlasting love, I'll never ever leave you nor forsake you. He, he's, if God be for us, who can be against us? And so as we, as we allow this word to get inside us, as we get a, let it get around us, we've got to take the more earnest heed. We've got to listen to what the word of God says. Just because, because some fail or enter into, uh, you know, something there that's hurt. There's a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I've failed. Anybody else here ever failed? Condemnation comes your way and the enemy grips you and gets a hold of you and you start thinking, man, I've missed it. I'm no good. God doesn't love me. You know, God doesn't care about me anymore. I've, I've lost it or goodness knows what else. But because we've failed in the past or because we see other people that have failed, friend, don't allow failure to get around you. You've got to start to meditate on the Word. The Bible, you know, with, with Joshua, he said, Joshua, meditate on this Word day and night. Do not let it depart from you, but be very, very courageous. Let this Word, he said, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. No, nothing's going to harm you. I'm going to, I'm going to protect you. And of course, we know that Joshua rose up and he allowed the Word of God to overtake 
the, the, what, how he was feeling and whatever was going on. And of course, we know that he took the people of God into the promised land. Just because some failed to enter into the fullness of what God wants for, uh, through Jesus Christ or what God has made available to us, that doesn't mean victory does not exist. I want you to turn to somebody and say, victory does exist. Victory in my life does exist. Victory is mine, amen. I can have victory. I'm going to choose to have victory. Just because I don't see it all the time doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Let us be encouraged by, by what Paul uh, wrote and amazing things Paul wrote in, in the Scriptures here. And I want you to just have a quick look with me and let me just read this again to you. And It's found in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. And, and, and Paul's praying here, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Friend, if we ask not, we don't get anything. Paul prayed that God would give us something. And I don't know about you, but I'm asking God, God, would you please give me wisdom and understanding? Would you please come and, 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 and war in my mind and, and, and break the strongholds that, that try to take me down a different road, take me away from where you're at? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is that, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. In other words, Jesus, what God did with Jesus, when God raised him from the dead, when God annihilated the works of the enemy, for this purpose was the Son of God made manifest, that he might destroy the works of Satan. What God did, as we heard so much, so wonderfully, Day in the communion, what Jesus did when God, when God raised him from the dead, what Jesus carried the filth and the rubbish and the and the everything that we that we have ever committed. I, I just got a picture of that this morning. Was it was a, a lot more than the little bit of a pile of rubbish that I had out at the back of my door. But can you imagine the filth and the rubbish and God had to somehow or other pour it out upon Jesus? That was an amazing thing. But he did it not so as that we could just walk around tiptoeing through the tulips with Tiny Tim. He wants us to be successful and victorious and understand that God has done something in Jesus Christ where he annihilated the works of the enemy, where he's given the church something so powerful. We have the name which is above every name. He's given us something there. He's become the head of the church. Jesus doesn't want his church going through life so miserable and, and defeated and, and that he wants us to be a victorious people. He wants us to rule and reign with him. Friend, friend, I'm praying that we can break some strongholds here that will cause us to say, hey, I'm not going to cop this any longer. I'm not going to tolerate this any longer. I'm going to rise up and I'm going to take hold of and I'm going to start speaking the word. I'm going to share. I'm going to allow the word to work mightily in me and it will cast out anything, any negative, any lying spirit, anything that's coming against what God says about me. We've got to break some things, friends. If we don't break them, they will break us. If we, don't, if we don't understand the truth, it will destroy us. Here he is here, Jesus speaking, and, and, and he's talking about what God has done. We want to be encouraged by, by the words of Paul. Encourage yourself, encourage yourself. I encouraged myself this morning as I remember running down and getting that little grub screw. I, 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 my whole life was in a mess at that point of time. My wife was in hospital having a nervous breakdown. I, I was in, an, in another city some thousand miles away. I was going through hell and myself, but somehow or other God wants to encourage us in the midst of it and show himself real. God wants to show himself real in the midst of your circumstance. 
in the midst of your situation. And here we, we find here in, in verse 19 of chapter 3, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life forever. Paul uh, was before this encounter a religious man. He was a religious man. His passion in life was to persecute the followers of Jesus Christ. But he met with Jesus. Friend, we've got to meet with Jesus. We've got to have a meeting place with Jesus. Do you know today that you can determine whether you meet with Jesus or whether you don't? Is that all right to say that? You can say, but Jesus... No, 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 no. I won't cop that. Jesus doesn't... No, 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 no. no. That's not true. Jesus does care. And if you've got any doubts whatsoever... See him hanging on that cross, stark naked, with all your garbage and my garbage all over him, and say he doesn't care. Hey? You know what else what amazes me about that? You know what amazes me is in the midst of all that, in the, in the midst of that, he could have said, God, I just want you to, to wipe out a few of them. <laughs> you know what he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't know about you, but I don't, I've never met a man with so much love and passion. And that's why I know we can come to him and we can say, God, I want, I, want to be, I want every stronghold broken from my life. I want every bit of unbelief. Friend, can I say this? The church is riddled with unbelief. Hey, and you know what? It must surely be a bit in me and a bit in you and a bit here, a bit there. It's riddled with unbelief. He persecuted the followers of Christ, but he met with Jesus on the road to Damascus. As a result, Paul knew all spirit-filled people, all these people that, that could be changed. Has anybody here changed? Would you give me a wave if you've been changed? Anybody here needed to be changed? Come on, give me a double, double wave. Anybody? Come on, I'm trying to make a point here. Anybody here ever been changed? Well, I want to tell you, that person that you hate down the end of the street can be changed too. Hey? If, I, if you and I got changed, anybody can get changed. I don't know about you, but I know that for a fact. I'm looking at some of you, and I, I'm not going to look anymore because you think I'm looking at you. But if God can change you, He can change anybody. Hey? Is that true or is that false? God can change anybody. But somehow or other, he wants to do a work in the church. He wants to do a work in our lives. He wants to, he wants to do something. So Paul had an encounter with God, and he knew that, that every believer, he saw God do great miracles. He saw God move by his spirit, and something on the inside of him rose up. And that's why he wrote these, these words that are found in Ephesians 1, that he said, my God, that you would open the eyes of the understanding, that they might know what is the exceeding abundance, my God, that, you might, that they might know, really know what, that you, what you did in Christ Jesus when you raised him from the dead, what you did to Satan. Friend, I want to tell you, your enemy is already defeated. He's only big in your imagination. He's only big in your mind. And if we can get our minds renewed and understand what the Word of God says, that we could have our, something enlarged on the inside that would see this Christ, the all-powerful, amen. He's not some little wimpy God. He is an all-powerful God. He's a God there that can speak and, and things will happen. He's a God that can, can look beyond the, the, the filthiness of man and say, I love you. He's a God that can pick you up out of the miry clay and shake you off. Even though you've been cursing him and, and carrying on, he can rise up above that and say, I love you. And he gets great joy when he sees our response. I believe God gets more joy out of watching his people rise up and say, devil, you are a liar, instead of saying, God, you're a liar. Oh. Our God is a good God. Amen. That's why he could say these words that, that you know, 
the, the what he walk, worked through Christ when he raised him the, from the dead. And then he made him head over the church. We are the body of Christ. God wants to do something so dynamic and so powerful. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, I read this the other week too. That you may really come to know. How many people really want to come to know? Come on. Lift up. Father, I really want to come to know. I really want to come to know. I just don't want to come to church and be like a parrot. Quoting things and saying, I really want to know you. I really, really, really want to know you. I really want to know what you did through Christ Jesus when you raised him from the dead. What you did to the enemy when, when he took the keys of hell and of death from him. When he took the authority that, that Adam had given to him, stripped him of that authority. And you gave gifts back to mankind. Raise us up, my God. Raise up your church, my God. Raise up your church, my God. Raise us up. That you may really come to know, practically, through experience for yourself, the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. That you may be filled through all your being. Under all the fullness of God may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God Himself. How many people would want that? Paul had a spirit, an experience that spoke louder than the obstacles he faced. He knew no devil or demonic force could stand against God's anointed. I want you to have a quick look with me in the book of Acts. Book of Acts. Acts chapter 19. The Bible says in verse 1, It happened while Apollos was in Corinth, at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed. So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Under then, under, <laughs> and he said to them, Under what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with other tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. Here's this Paul that's speaking about things that have happened. He's speaking about experiences that he's had. He comes into a situation where he finds 12 men that have, been, that have just been born again, just been saved. They've been uh, water baptized, but here they are, they're just wandering around. Paul comes and says, have you been filled? Have you been baptized? Uh, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? They said, we don't even know there was a Holy Spirit. How, what were you baptized? I want to ask today, what were we baptized into? Were we just dry, went in dry and come out wet? Did, 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 did we understand what was going on? Did we understand that, that we were identifying with a death, burial, and resurrection? Do we understand that, that then as the Holy Spirit came upon us, the greatest power on earth came upon us? The greatest force that could ever be put into man came upon us? Greater than any education you'd ever get at a university? Greater than anything that you could ever achieve on this planet? The greatest power on earth came into our lives. What an amazing thing. Verse 11, it says here that these people, they, they tarried there for about th two months and they, they got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Verse 11, it says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left them and evil spirits went out of them. 
And some of the internal uh, Jewish exodus took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the name, uh, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, uh, a Jewish chief priest, who did uh, so also. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirits was leapt on them, overpowered them, prevailed over them, uh, against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This went out and people heard about it. The Bible says that great fear came upon these people. Move of God started to happen. Verse 24, and a certain... Uh, a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shines, uh, shrines to Diana, brought no small, small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the works of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that the, we have the, our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, moreover, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned many away, and many people are saying that they are not gods which are made by hands. And so they started to say, but not only is this trade, not only is our trade uh, diminishing, but something's happening. It's not something's happening that even the great goddess of Diana is losing her power. Friend, I want to tell you today, there are principalities and powers that may not be Diana that people are worshipping, but in Australia, in, on the Sunshine Coast, there are many gods that people worship. There are many things there that people worship. And you know, we the church here, we're, we're, we're trying to build the church, we're wanting you know, to see this and we're wanting to see that. Friend, I want to say this to you today, nothing is going to change until we change. Nothing's going to change until we start to go around and start to tell people what God is doing in our land. Nothing's going to change until you start giving your testimony to your people. I want to tell you, there's not so, people aren't really interested in this or that. But what they're interested in today is because there's so much need and there's so much lack and there's so much, you know, even people are in the valley of decision that are, that are con contemplating, they, they hear this about the church. But friend, I want to tell you, your testimony is so valuable. Your testimony is so powerful that you can go out there and say, this is what God is doing. This is what Jesus is doing. This is what's happening in my life. I want to tell you, my life has been changed. I want to tell you, my life has been transformed. I want to tell you, once upon a time, I persecuted the Christians. But on the way to Damascus, something dynamic happened to my life. And I met with Jesus Christ. Friend, I want to say this. We can be the church and we can sing lullabies till the cows come home. We can even pray faithfully faithless prayers. We can even say things and do things, but we will not change anything. But friend, I want to tell you this one thing that you and I need more than anything else is a meeting place with our God. To come face to face with our Christ. To meet with Him, friend, and not put off excuses why this happens to me and why I can't do this and why I can't do that. Because I want to tell you, you are testifying to people by saying, I can't. But I want to tell you, you can testify if you say, I can. There are people that need to be delivered from stuff. There are people here that need to change their lifestyle. There are people here that need to break strongholds. There are people that we just need to say, God, the greater one within me, rise up within me. I want a meeting place with you, my God. I want to meet with you. I want to have an encounter with you that will change me forever. I don't know about you, but I, I had an encounter. Has anybody else ever had an encounter with God? But you know, sometimes it might have been a long time ago and somehow that encounter sort of fades away in the darkness. Sometimes you, you start to forget exactly what God's done for you. But I want to tell you, if you sit around and the other, other day out there at um, 
Bow Desert. I, I met up with, with Ivan Nosworthy and we were sitting there and we started to talk about the days of old. We started to talk about the outpouring of the Spirit that came to our movement in, in, in uh, 93. We started to talk about something that so dynamically touched people's lives. And as we talked about it, you could feel an atmosphere starting to build. You could feel something starting to get around it. An excitement started to rise again. Amen. And I want to tell you, I'm stirred up still because I want to go again. I want to start regurgitating those things that perhaps happened years ago. But I want to tell you, it's the same Jesus. My God never changes. What happens is I might have drifted away, but I'm coming back. Hallelujah. I'm coming back. I'm coming under the spout where the glory comes out. I'm going to cry out to my God until God come out or other touches my life. Did all that and I never spat my teeth out. Amazing. <laughs> you know that they say that 12, these 12 men that followed Paul, they went into some place and, and they, they started a, a, a study there. And you heard the, the, the guy there say that not only in, in, in uh, Ephesia, Ephesia, but also all of Asia. They say that the church grew to over 40,000 people in two years. That's what the historians say. Over 40,000 people in two years. Friend, I want to tell you, you can bash your head on the wall, you can bash your gums together, you can do whatever you like, but I want to tell you, Friend, we need an encounter with God. We need to be able to come and worship and lift up our hands and sing praises to God. Amen. We've got to open ourselves up. When an altar call is made, oh, not me, who oh, and people. No, we've got to be open and say, that is me. That's me. <laughs> oh, no, if somebody might think, who cares what people think when God Almighty is watching over you? Yeah. When God Almighty is looking at us. Who cares if my pride, and I don't know about you, you ever had your pride wrecked? I can remember one meeting I was in, there was all these big knobs. We were out there praying and worshipping. And I, I felt the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I started to sing in the Spirit. Sing this prophetic, it went so flat, you got no idea. Clark was running the meeting, he looked at me and said, oh, no. And I said, I'll never do that again. But see, that's just the devil trying to stop your gift. That's the devil trying to stop the gift. You'll make a muff, you'll make mistakes, but God loves us, amen. God cares for us. I oh, know, I think the, I've worked this up, I swear to you. <laughs> How about anything else? Oh, God. Come on, let's, let's stand to our feet. Pagan worship will cease. These people tried the best they could. They started shouting for two hours. Great is Diana! Great is Diana! But Diana wasn't listening. <laughs> but friend, if we could just stand up here and say, Great is our God. How great is our God. Do we know that song? How great is our God. We know it. Of course we do. But how great is the Word of God in you? How great is the Word of God in you? Today's the day of change. Today's the day that we say, God, I don't want to mess around. See, 12, 12, just freshly baptized in the Holy Spirit with Paul, turned a whole nation, turned over 40,000 people. You know, today, we, as a church, we can say, well, let's, let's paint all the walls black. Let's, let's, let's put the flashing lights in. 
I'm not against anything like that. I'm not, but that's not the answer. If you think that's the answer, glory to God, let's go and buy some paint. Let's buy some light. No, that's not the answer. See, you're the answer. You're the answer. You're the answer to this city. Jesus has already given it everything we need. So God, open the eyes of my understanding. Open me up to the realm of the Spirit. Open me, my God, to the greatness that that is made available to us. Open it up to us. Change me, Lord. Change me. Don't want to just become a cranky old man. Don't want to be just this or that. I want to be somebody that's showing forth your glory. We're going to sing this song. And you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's good just to respond to the Spirit. God, here I am. I want you to touch my life. Friend, don't think you're so bulletproof. Don't think you're so spiritual. Don't think you're so so good that you don't need another touch. Break that stronghold. That's a stronghold. I I just want you, God. I want you, God. You might want to come and stand out here and sing the song with the with the group feel free just to come you might want to say god i want to just open my heart to something whatever just let god be god in your life god's god's speaking to me right now there's some people in this place and you've had a dream you've had a vision but now right now it's dormant and you've even been saying, yeah, well, that must be gone now. It's finished. It's over. You've got a, a dozen good reasons why it's over. You've got many good reasons why it's over. You can say this and that and this and that. That's why it's over. Because, because, because. But I want to give you one reason why it's not over. Because Jesus is not finished yet. He is not finished yet. He's not finished with you. He's not finished with anybody. Moses, in the backside of a desert, the year age, 80 years of age, thought it was over. And he had many reasons why it was over, but it wasn't over because God wasn't finished with him. And if you can somehow or other say, God, you're not finished with me yet. And I repent of saying it's over, I want you to breathe again on the coals in my life and cause that dream to burst into flame again. Burst it, burst into flame again. That I can be active, that I can be, that I can be, be somebody that you can use in your kingdom, my God. The enemy thought, it, if I can use your words, that it put me in a coffin. God's got you for revival, amen. Don't let the devil put you in a coffin. Don't let the devil slam that lid down on your life. Don't let the devil shut you down. Somehow or other, rise up this morning and say, I'm going to get out of that box. I'm going to get out of that thing. I'm going to be used by God. And if that's you, I would be quickly coming out here while we're singing this song. Come on now, quickly.